I'm here with Mab Segrist. She's the author of this new book, Administrations of Lunacy. She's also the topic of our special episode released in March. Mab's joining me from Durham, North Carolina. Mab, while you are in the preparation for the release of this book, which is about the racist roots of American psychiatry, a global pandemic breaks out. Start by introducing yourself to our audience, including our listening audience, and tell us your thoughts. My name is Mab Segrist. I'm sitting on my porch in Durham, North Carolina, and it is spring. Things are blooming. The birds are singing. I hope they won't distract us, but I'm very glad to be here with you today. I'm a white 71-year-old lesbian. I have on my jeans jacket, and uh, I'm ready to go. We are in the middle of a pandemic now, but for many of us, it might be that the particularities of this disaster are surprising, but the fact that we were headed increasingly towards disaster has been a feeling that many people I think have shared, even though we've understood it differently. So so this particular disaster and how does it relate to the history that I trace in administrations of lunacy? One, we're in an administration of lunacy now. For me to study a state hospital with a 170 year trajectory as George's did in the little town of Milledgeville um, was to study the history of slavery and the legacies, its afterlives. But it was also to study the best practices, the resistances, the counter tendencies that come into today too. So I ended the book with a discussion of the afterlives of slavery and what I called our ecologies of sanity the need to eliminate afterlives of slavery and elevate ecologies of sanity is more pressing than it ever has been in my lifetime anyway. So so I think that there's a contribution more broadly that the book brings um, in terms of some of its themes. You say we are living in an administration of lunacy right now. Reiterate that. I like the irony in that title because administration of lunacy could mean the administrators are the lunatics as much as anybody that they would be administering. There's really kind of ironic slippage there. And the point that I make in the book over and over by putting this particular hospital into the wild and turbulent history of Georgia, the South, and really the Americas um, for 200 years is that the bedlam, which is what's associated with the lunatic asylum, is really in the culture too. It's lawlessness and chaos and all of these different turbulent factors. And then some people get put in an asylum. Well, we've got a lot of chaos today, and I would say some lawlessness and just a lot of stuff happening on the outside um, that makes us feel like maybe maybe this is an administration of lunacy. Maybe the, they're not administering sanity they're administering something else. And how do we, how do we re, as, as citizens, as people on the ground, uh, as people in families and communities, how do we start steering this? And how do we keep ourselves healthy, our communities healthy? How do we hold our officials to accountability when we feel like they're administering the wrong kind of thing? Like, how, are, how do we do all that? Mm-hmm. I do think that there's evidence and heartening um, examples from the research that I did. Mm. I want to get to some of those examples in just a minute, but to put a little bit more of a pin on it, I've been thinking a lot about your book, and one of the big lessons I took away from our experience together was that when you allow, when you allow a society that embraces lynching to decide who is sane and who is not, you're really rooting your public health systems in racism, also sexism, and denial. And that problem with our core health system seems all too evident today. Yes, I think that's fairly accurate. Um, the, Georgia, the Georgia lunatic, epileptic, and idiot asylum, all of those words hard to say and hard to hear, so I'm just gonna say the asylum here on out. But the Georgia asylum was founded in 1842 closed down in 2010. It went through various iterations of what actually medicine is. And the idea of public health emerges in the late 19th century um, on the idea that there is scientific medicine, that things like 
microscopes can tell the particular germs that cause particular diseases. They can let you either prevent those diseases or eventually find cures for them. That we can have practice of sanitation like sterilizing instruments, which they weren't sterilized during the Civil War, during all those amputations, if you think about that, it was really tragic. Um, so we learned, we learned all these things in the late 19th century that really changed our lives and gave many of us anyway, much longer lifespans. So what are those lessons and what happens when you don't pay that attention to them? One of the things I saw most vehemently at the Georgia Asylum is the people who were in charge of the asylum and those asylums across the South and Southern medicine really, which was elite white men, uh, were trying to take back control of the South from emancipated slaves and from the abolition movement. And they locked onto this old pro-abolition idea that slavery was help, was a healthy thing for slaves. It was a hygienic institution. It kept slaves healthy. It gave them structure and food and, and in a very kind of infantilizing way. They should have stayed that way. You know, like anything that African Americans were experiencing after the Civil War, the after effects of brutal slave systems, the diseases that spread across the South, then Klan lynching and convict lease and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it wasn't that that was creating any difficulties, it was just emancipation. In fact, in 1895, the Southern superintendents got together at a meeting in Asheville and they had all these science and, and labs kind of meetings in the afternoon, but in the evening they had a session called, was emancipation prejudicial to the Negro? This was, and they all agreed it was. So like, I'm trying not to like curse, but like, <laughs> fuck science. I mean, you know, like so much for science. Emancipation is what hurt the Negro. And so that's the cure to the Negro is like to get back under these systems of control. That was the, that was the medicine. And so this you're underscoring that this is the crucible or some of the birthplace of our public health system and our response no, to crisis. No, like, this is the opposition to it. Our public health system is a hero in my book. It is heroic. It puts us in community. It makes us accountable to environments. It makes our public officials accountable to those environments too. It shows us we can clean up environments and be healthier. It shows that germs have no color line. Is the black people in Atlanta tried to persuade the deluded white people um, who thought that transmission was only from black people to white people when they were the, a lot of the ones with the germs, like germs have no color line. All of that is public health. It emerged in the late 19th, early 20th century. It is heroic. It is a heroic force in my book. But then you have these counter ideas that, that try to shoot it down, that try to displace it. And this idea that emancipation was prejudicial to the Negro is the anti-idea to public health. It's the antithesis. So if you believe that then, you're gonna track people onto sterilization and eugenics, which these guys do, as the whole country does, the whole world does. Um, but if you do that, and that's what you're thinking, it's heredity, it's only heredity that's landing all these people in the asylum. At the same time, you're reporting high rates of TB contracted in the asylum because the circumstances are very crowded, especially for black people, and folks are coughing on each other. And so that is, <clears throat> that is a disease vector. And the public health response to that is what we know now is called social distancing. But if you have people crowded in these asylums and you're crowding all the black people in one place, but the white people aren't too good either, or you've got people in Rikers now, or all these prisons crowded in together, the public health solution is to give more space. We're, we're learning that, like social distance, spaciousness. These guys don't do that. Also, people in those asylums were getting sick from pellagra, and it turned out pellagra was a nutritional deficiency. It comes from the lack of vi vitamin B. They didn't know that then, but they brought in, in, in Milledgeville in Georgia, had one of the best experiments from the US Public Health Service. A doctor named Joseph Goldberger came down from New York. He was an Austrian immigrant and a Jew. So he had a different outlook when he looked around the Georgia asylum, and he figured, that it had to do with nutrition. And the doctors told him, oh no, like we all eat the same thing. But he just went into the cafeteria and he paid attention like empiricism, you look at reality. If you're so blinded by racism or sexism, you don't see reality and you come up with these bullshit 
solutions that just make things worse, right? So he said, oh, food distribution. And then he thought again, used his noggin, who are the people who don't get pellagra, which is breaking out across the South, terrible epidemic, a lot like AIDS, didn't know what it was, afraid of it. And he said, you know, the only people who don't get it are the well-to-do. So he concluded, let's do a little experiment at Milledgeville and let's feed a couple of wards the diet of the well-to-do. So <laughs> he gets a black woman's ward and a white woman's ward. He does not just go to white people. He, puts, he does not go to men. He takes women. He takes a black and a white women's ward, very sick people, and he feeds them the diet of the well-to-do. And I meant to pull that up, but they get steak and bread pudding and roast beef and peas and cream <laughs> for six to, to 12 months. And they must have been shocked at first. And I'm sure the nurses must have introduced it gradually because they'd been eating molasses, coffee, fat back, and cornmeal. That was their breakfast. So of course people are starving, you know. So they they showed that you can cure you can keep people from getting pellagra, even the sickest people, by giving them the diet of the well to do. And mm -hmm. you do this another couple of years. He went to also not such good methodology, but he went to a white man's prison in, in Mississippi and got those 12 of those guys to promise if, promise on, 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 like if they started eating a pellagra diet, they would get out, you know, after, after mm. a year, they would be released, they would get pardoned. So they said, yeah, and then they started starving and getting sick and they really freaked out and they just tried to call the whole mm. thing off. But he did, he did show in that process then that you can both, cure pellagra and prevent it, and you can cause it by changes in diet. And what was the reaction to that research? Well, <clears throat> different people, different ways. Southern politicians thought he was, many of them thought he was making the South look bad, um, which if he was, if the shoe fits, wear it. So, but many of them started to apply those ideas. Um, however, it meant you had to feed people better. And that was a political question. Mm. In, and in these asylums, the very patients were growing this whole kind of plantation farm where every year in their asylum, they recorded how many tons of cabbage and gallons of milk and pounds of lard and just all of this food they were producing. And yet people were eating fat back and coffee. So food is going somewhere, not them. So, I mean, again, and let me just summarize I, this. So the t the same time, the people had these very racist ideas that were not empirical, that things were like insanity and disease was being caused in black people because they should have been slaves. They were ignoring the very epidemiological conditions within their own asylums that they were actually responsible for that were making people massively sick. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you have the bad idea you fixate on it and you don't really see reality because reality will come get us. Reality will come get us. And racism, uh, racism, homophobia, they really get in the way. The parallels to this moment are pretty clear. I, I hear uh, uh, bells ringing in my mind around the conflict between science and science denial, between best practices of public health that are known, understood, and empirically based, and political uh, concern for appearances and attention, you know, concern about resources, and we might have to share stuff and do things differently. Um, you might not need to restate any of that for people to get it, but what is your message for today? And what do you think we need to be doing in this moment? My message for today is we have a lot of the tools at our disposal. Many of them have been misrepresented and misunderstood till, till it's gotten to a point of crisis. In my book, I called it ecologies of sanity. Like how do we keep each other sane? How do we keep ourselves sane? And how do we keep each other healthy? And we know that. And, um, you know, so we know social distancing now. We know wash our hands, which is pretty basic and goes back to childhood. We know, um, you know, share stuff. We know don't hoard, but let's stay away from each. We know those kind of things because of all of these decades, really, of public health. Uh, and now we have to figure out how to organize politically in an environment of quarantine. And, and people are really turning to the Internet in very inventive ways. Um, we've got the whole electoral system, which seems so bizarre and berserk anyway, but at least we've got that to use. 
Um, and we know that we want to flatten, you know, we, we know we need to flatten the virus as it goes through. I mean, we know all these things, um, but we also need to figure out and have always had to figure out how to, how to keep ourselves sane, how to keep ourselves healthy, how to keep in community. I mean, all of those things help our immune systems. They all help our health and our psychic well-being and our physical well-being are just not, this, they're always the same thing. Yeah. So, so how do we in a period of state lockdown, when the state's struggling in its various manifestations to figure out how to get us the things we need like masks and ventilators. I mean, this is not rocket science. It's distribution, you know? So how do we redistribute ourselves? How do we insist that they do better? They cannot have these lethal practices. And if they do have these lethal practices, they have to be held accountable for it at the ballot box, which they cannot try to steal from us again, because they're doing all this at the same time for 200, 300 years, you know, like all of those things. But I think the new thing too, is how digitalized we are, how, what the, how the economy is structured. And all of a sudden, I think many of us are noticing, like all of a sudden capital is stopping. All of a sudden, you know, things are closing. All of a sudden, oh, maybe people do need health insurance. All of a sudden, people need more unemployment. I mean, some of these ideas that have been lying around since the Great Depression, which this could also be, are also relevant too. So just but, but the environment, it seems to me, is the new thing. And this idea of quarantine that has such a power when the person at the top is administering his own lunacy. Yeah. So, you know, how do we do all that, you know? The other thing that I'm reminded of, Mab, is a tour that we made long ago, before this trip, before this book, before you ever went to Milledgeville, of the South after a hurricane. And we were looking at the negative legacy of plantation economics, the global supply chain, mass production at the cost of small production and family farms, um, migrant work, uh, the, uh, the attacks on farm, family farmers, the devastating impact of these factory farms, pig, pig farms and others. Um, that's going back to the 1990s, but I'm thinking of it now because the other thing we're looking at in this moment is the downside of our monopoly capital economy. Um, but we're not prepared to create a new one today. How do you see us emerging from this differently? How, how do you, if this is a collapse for, for capitalism or a certain kind of crisis for capitalism, what comes next? Well, lots of different questions in there. Let me just briefly go back to Hurricane Floyd, which I was happy to travel with you and see all of that. We have lots of different experiences <laughs> going here. Um, but what struck me is I went into all of these communities in Eastern North Carolina, which are the Black Belt, which means Black soil, which meant Black people worked as slaves. And they are the most repressive parts of North Carolina. They have the most social control and legislative control. But what I saw is in every register, transportation, health, housing, jobs, all of these things, those communities, those poor black communities were already at disaster proportions. The disaster was racism. Yeah. The disaster was systemic racism. And then you put in a hurricane on top of that and it just expands that exponentially. And the people hurt the most are already the people hurt the most. You know, it just gets worse. So I think, you know, like how, how healthcare gets apportioned here. Does it get to Eastern North Carolina? What happens to people when there's not ventilators? Who gets the ventilators? Who gets the test? I and mean, we're already seeing if you're a politician, if you're a sports person, you get tested and you know, and so Tom Hanks and, you know, like Ted Cruz is and you know, all these folks. And I mean, Trump was exposed. Um, but anyway, the, all those folks will get good health care. So what happens to the rest of us? And we really have to insist again that we have to arrange the economy differently. They're about to put huge amounts of money on the table, including direct payments to us and institute because of the Democratic Congress, inst House of Representatives institute some of these New Deal type programs. But the whole thing does seem to be like teetering. And I am not an anarchist. <laughs> I've never... <laughs> because I do think, you know, and maybe I've misunderstood it, but whatever, whatever anarchy is in the wrong way, when it comes to you and things collapse, you have to rebuild, you have to rebuild. And there's, there's going to be a lot of rebuilding that's needed and a lot of very bad ideas that have been exposed and a lot of 
maldistribution that is just criminal, that is just criminal. So, so there is that, you know, we'll come through it and we'll come through it on a diff in a different world. Um, will Amazon rule the world? Um, will Amazon be in charge of our distribution? You know, what, how, how are we re redistributing too? So there's still this conflict between our ecologies of sanity and justice and their ecologies of slavery and afterlives of slavery. And it's just, it's a heightened contradiction. You know, Hegel called it a struggle to the death, but there's a huge struggle that's going on here has been going on and has just been elevated because of the disaster of this virus on top of healthcare systems um, that people are having to live through. And some yeah. of us won't, you know, but nobody lives forever, you know, but some of us won't. And, and in Durham, that hasn't really hit yet. In other places, it really has. I'm very, call out to all my friends in New York, because um, I know it's, you know, y'all, y'all on the front lines there. So, but anyway. We're many of us in the front lines in cities. Um, that does leave us with some time on our hands. Your book is an incredible read. It's, uh, in case you didn't figure it out yet, it is entirely relevant to this moment. Um, it's just out, not even quite out. It'll be out at the very beginning of April from the new press. If you haven't watched our special with Mab, we travel, I get to travel all over Georgia and Alabama. We sit down with Brian Stevenson from the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery. Uh, we witnessed the unveiling of a monument to lynching victims of the 1950s and later. Uh, we talk about history, we talk about justice, uh, and suddenly it all seems so incredibly relevant uh, to this crisis that we're in, a different sort of administration of lunacy, uh, but one from which we absolutely have to emerge different. We can't repeat this history. We have to do it better. Mab, you're helping. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I, I hope everybody checks out the book and the video. Um, and I'm going to have a chance to finally. Hey, I'm just sitting here. I've also got MabSeers.com. Just be, I'm, you know, hey, I like to chat with my readers. <laughs> All right. Anytime. Look forward to it. Mab, thank you so much.